I'm James Holder. Welcome to Football Football 24. Quite privileged to be joined by former Leighton Orient manager and, dare I say, football historian, John Sitton. How are you? All right, James. Yeah, not too bad. Not too bad. Yourself? Yeah, not too bad. How's everything where you are? Um, hope you're feeling, feeling a bit better, mate. Yeah. Yeah, I feel much better getting stronger every day. Yeah, I was just uh, talking before you come, come in with the introduction, you know, about bits and pieces to look forward to because nobody's really got any routine. I just... I'm just trying to build my strength back up. I've got a little, you know, doing my groundwork every day, go for a walk, got my weights in the in the garage. So um, I just got to get the heavy bag back up and the speed ball, you know what I mean? So I just I just look forward to that, really. Just like half hour, 20 minutes, half hour, 40 minutes, depending on how I feel, especially at my age, you know what I mean? So you've got to do something. When I see you engaging with people on Twitter, um, having debates, having rants, I'm starting to see that you're you're coming back to yourself. That's a sign. <laughs> <laughs> That's <a> normal. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh well. Yeah. Yeah. You're right. Yeah. I suppose it is a sign that I'm coming back to myself. You know what I mean? It's um, it's funny. You know, the um, probably it's, well, without a doubt, I don't think there's no probably about it. Without a doubt, it's, it's probably it, it, I'm of the opinion it's come too late. You know, where people uh, have just started to correspond. Um, I was contacted by one of my former managers, funny enough. And it's funny, like, I, I'm going to send him another reply later on. I've got to wait for my wife to get home because I'm not computer literate. I can't send emails and all that. Um, but we've commu <laughs> we've communicated far more than we ever did when I was his captain, <laughs> which is ironic. So, But it's nice, uh, in answer to your point, that, that people sort of um, raise issues and speculate as to what your opinion might be you know i've just done i've had very strong opinions over the last couple of days about the mayor uh, about the traffic system about the money wasted on cyclists about um well london the uk but london in particular mind you most cities are the same we're like the, the, the crime and drugs capital of europe now um and then the recent spate over the weekend and i sarcastically said to someone you know maybe we should take a knee to raise awareness uh, like 16 stabbings, two deaths over the weekend. You know what I mean? I think it's absolutely diabolical. And also, I've got a question. No, I mean, um, we're going off piece because we're here to talk about football. But I, I do keep a close eye on current affairs and politics because it's all uh, for decades now shambolic and it's like um, poorly prepared and disorganised and sticky plaster solutions. Uh, because it's like I remarked before, you've got too many people who ain't been at the coalface. You know, they go from a privileged household to a privileged uh, fee-paying school to a privileged university to an internship. And then before you know it, they're uh, making policy in Whitehall. You know what I mean? I think it's despicable, disgusting. Um, and, and I think it's, it's absolutely nothing short of uh, diabolical with regards to the goings-on and the waste of life. But I questioned, um, I, was, I was, you know, uh, procrastinating over the question um, how much bile, vitriol, anger and hatred do does an individual really have to have to be able to um, chase someone down like a pack animal and stab them, you know what I mean? So, uh, you know, it's quite obvious that uh, these people need help to me, but patently obvious. But I've been listening to the same bullshit since the mid-80s, you know what I mean? And then if the truth be told, you know, um, I've had thousands and thousands of magnificent reviews on the, on my book and f so much positive feedback. And uh, it's just, uh, it's funny how you remember, it's like defeats in football, you know, like you you, you skip past the victories and, and remembering uh, the defeats and you and you, you languish on the defeats and you, you harbour on about, how, you know, how to improve things, right? The one happened to be a West Ham punt. I don't know whether it's because I played with Chelsea or Millwall. He said that... Um, uh, which I've never been, and I made a I made a, a statement, many statements, many times. I just I basically state the facts, but he, he accused me of uh, trying to play play the victim. Do you know what I mean? Um, so the point being, we can all make excuses if we want to to be uh, antisocial and try and be public enemy number one. But I think you'll find that my generation, most of us, were mixed in with uh, so-called in inverted commas. <laughs> ethnic minorities, my people came from nothing. 15th, 15th century uh, uh, gypsies, uh, gypsy silk traders. Um, so, you know, probably come over with the Huguenots. Uh, were persecuted on the borders of Spain and France. Uh, the bottom line being, we were all mixed in. English, my best mates were Greek Cypriot, 
Um, I ended up marrying his sister. My other best mate was Jamaican, and my other best mate was another English kid. Do you know what I mean? So, um, and we were all raised on a council estate. You know what I mean? So I, I don't subscribe to the latter day, uh, woe is me, woe is me, absentee father, uh, mother's got three jobs, left to, you know, thing on the streets. I just think it's um, it's a bent economy thing and uh, narcissism and arrogance not to take up uh, education and or a trade and a job. They want a shortcut to riches and they don't realise that the very establishment that they despise uh, are preying on them and using them. Because uh, make no mistake about it, uh, nothing, nothing's going to get through um, without somebody say so. It's like the, it's like the crack epide epidemic in um, in America, in New York in particular, in the eighties. And I saw I saw a guy interview, black guy, and uh, I thought magnificent, what a great orator, you know. He said, look, have it right. Um, this country, if uh, people choose for it to be the case. You can't even get a Cuban cigar this size smuggled into the country. <laughs> and yet there's tons and tons and tons of cocaine coming over the borders. <laughs> well, that's the, it's the case with, with, uh, with the United Kingdom now. It don't come in without somebody say so who's getting a nice bung eye up. And these kids are, are, are subscribing to the very establishment that they, uh, they propose to hate or that they articulate that they hate. So it's all a little bit of... Um, uh, it's perplexing and it's a little bit of waffle and bullshit to me. You know what I mean? I can I can smell it a mile off. But there we are. All you can do, Jay, is uh, is uh, try and stay out of the way and avoid it, which unfortunately, an aspiring lawyer, lovely looking kid, uh, he couldn't over the weekend. I think it's nothing short of diabolical, disgusting and despicable what's happening at, the, at this moment in time. And like I've said, which we're going to come to, um, sport, mainly football, drugs, uh, alcohol, tobacco and gambling are the five distractions that the establishment need to keep us uh, as diversions, to keep us um, focused away from the real problems in the country. Enough. I'm, I'm 62 this year and I've been listening to the same bollocks for 40 years. Nothing's changed. Nothing's changed. Whether it's grassroots football, when I was at the FA in the 80s and 90s, um, and like uh, uh, com confused and conflicting messages in the sponsorship, ergo McDonald's and obesity. <laughs> they're having a laugh. They're having a laugh. <laughs> they're having a laugh. Um, but it's sort of do. It's sort of do with uh, spondulix. You know what I mean? Whether it's that or whether it's um, fighting poverty, whether it's apprenticeships, whether it's uh, uh, giving kids the right start, whether it's education, whether it's to try and. Uh, steer them away from gangs and steer away from crime. I've been listening to the same messages for 40 years. It's like football punditry on the TV, James, right? I can sit here, you can sit here, we can give a list like they do, as long as you're armed, uh, at the faults. But this is where uh, my podcast differs, the Football Uncensored podcast. We did another one last night. Um, we don't, uh, we'll mention the problem, but what we try and do is concentrate on the solution. Everybody can list the problems, but whether it's punditry on the TV or radio, whether it's uh, uh, pol politics, whether it's MPs, whether it's opportunist careerist MPs, which they're, they're in abundance, and fence jumpers like I've been listening to for decades, like George Galloway, right? Um, you can list the problems and have problems uh, coming out your ass, but there's very, very few people who offer the solutions. So that's where I like to think I'm a bit different. But I've never been approached and I've never been asked. And I wouldn't know where to begin with regards to um, uh, putting a marker down. And, um, you know, might, might, <laughs> maybe, uh, you know, making a, making a different career for myself. Um, at the end of the day now, I think it's got to the stage where um, it's like sort of a, a King Canute thing. You know what I mean? You're sitting there, they would be sitting there trying to stem the tide. Um, and it's just not going to happen. Yeah, they're going to say, just trying to turn the tide back. It's just not going to happen. I remember having a row with George Galloway on. Um, he used to do a show on Talk Sport 10 p.m. to 1 a.m. on a Friday and Saturday night. And because obviously I worked as a black cab driver Friday and Saturday night, I used to listen to it quite a few times. I used to ring in. And I remember having a discussion with him about um, uh, crime, um, immigration, and infrastructure. And I've been proved right. I was right then and I'm right now. 
uh, what he'd done, he banned me for, I think it was three to six months. He ended up letting me back on air anyway, just before he, uh, just before he, he, he had to go because he was running for something. He was running for a seat. So uh, the show couldn't be politicised. Um, and lo and behold, what happens is uh, he, he's, uh, which is all part of it, he becomes a couple of years back pro-Brexit. You know what I mean? This is what I mean by opportunist careerist fence jumpers. That's uh, harsh but true. It's got quite an exciting weekend on the football front. Just gone. Um, Manchester City stamping some dominance on the league, beating the current champions 4-1. That takes mm. them five points clear of the game in hand. What, Man United? Yeah. No, yeah, you're right. It was very exciting. Fantastic weekend's football. Um, very enterprising, very attacking. And I thought Man City were uh, two, three yards too quick and a class above. And what it is, so I had this discussion last night, James, and I've never ever understood it. And it might sound a little bit narcissistic and self indulgent, right? But I had this situation at Gillingham with um, not only a pygmy, but also turned out to be an intellectual pygmy. And um, unfortunately, it was one of them who. He was one of them, Keith Peacock. Let, let me draw a film analogy. He was one of them who, at the time, he was um, he, he, he strutted around and conducted himself and tried to be as ruthless and thought he was Vito Corleone. And uh, if the truth be told, he ended up looking like Fredo Corleone. Um, the bottom line being, um, in answer to the point with regards to Liverpool, what when I was at Gillingham, and this is the mistake that Klopp's made, is he's got a problem area. So we know when everybody's fit, he's got a good goalkeeper, he's got a very good back four, a very good midfield and a very good forward line, right? Um, although someone's intimated that the forward line has now been together for four years and they might be going a bit stout, right? But it's like the cliche, you know, um, form is temporary, class is permanent. Now, looking at the back line... What I don't understand, James, is this, right? I don't understand why it is, is um, and I was a victim of this, as I say, the Peacock will say, can you do a job for me at right back? Well, I went there, um, educated for six years at one of the best youth academies in the country, if not the world, if not Europe and the world, Chelsea Football Club, by coaches who, who were firmly of the belief that we should follow along the lines of the Ajax, um, mantras and doctrines when they dominated Europe and won the uh, European Cup three years on the spin, right? So I was very, very well educated in terms of football IQ and football intelligence, right? So Peacock was saying to me, can you do a job for me at right back? Can you do a job for me at left back? I know you're a centre half, uh, but can you do a job for me in midfield? I've got injuries and suspensions, right? Be because obviously I was being penalised for me all-round ability and football IQ. And uh, at the time... Um, being a cross between maybe, um, you know, a light heavyweight boxer and a middle distance runner. I could get around the pitch and, and uh, put my foot in, right? So the bottom line is this. Klopp has got a problem with regards to his centre-backs. He's introduced the kids who quite clearly even haven't been, uh, they either haven't been um, educated well enough in their, um, <clears throat> excuse me, in their academy and or they're quite clearly not up to it with regards to their decision-making, poor defending, getting caught the wrong side, etc. right? But what he's done is, I, I don't understand why you would disturb uh, one compartment of the team, right? And disrupt one compartment of the team to try and compensate for another compartment of the team that we know is already disrupted. You understand? Because all that can come out of that is, Instead of uh, just having one area that's weakened, ergo the centre-backs, you've now got two areas that are weakened. And I think it was shown quite clearly uh, with regards to the way Manchester City moved the ball and targeted certain areas uh, of, of the field that um, that was the case. And, and, and the, the two midfield players who were put in there are not up to it either. Uh, what, 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 could, what you could have, you could have a situation where if it was me and I was advising as a member of Klopp's staff, I would say what we've got to do, we've got to try and play the game further up the field, as far up the field as we possibly can. We've got to try and press from the front. And what we do, we leave our front free, uh, Mane, Firmino, Salah. But what we've got to do, uh, we, we leave them in situ, right? But what we've got to try and do is get them to press from the front and then knowing that we've got a good compartment and get them pressing in support 
to try and alleviate the pressure on a weak and back four. But what he's done is he's just gone, well, what we do, we take two very two cracking players out of there to try and compensate for the loss of the two players there. Well, in the end, instead of one area that's weak, you've now got two areas that are, that are weak. Well, while I think of it, I've got to come to this. I think the alarm bell should be ringing for Gareth Southgate with uh, regards to Trent Alexander-Arnold. I thought his defending was embarrassing. It was really like despicable, laughable. It was under 14 right back, uh, going in too fast. Uh, well, like, even when you're coaching in a grid, which like that shows me he either weren't taught or he forgot. You close down quickly, then what you do, you apply the brakes and then you slow your approach. You don't go rushing into someone like Raheem Sterling, who could, uh, Raheem Sterling, who could just skip by you and go either side, right? Uh, that's the first thing. He went in too quick and sold himself, got beat too easy, uh, never, never put the brakes on. Um, his recovery ones uh, runs were, um, I thought, lazy. Um, I thought, like I said, he, he got beat too easy and Sterling could have gone either way. That tells me that um, he never had what I used to coach with defenders. You've got to have, you know, obviously your mind's racing, you're making uh, split second decisions and the pitch is changing within split seconds. What you've got to do, you've got to have a stillness in your mind. You've got to be uh, disciplined and focused. And if you're going like, 1v1 with someone like Ronaldo, Ronaldo or Sterling, obviously it's unlikely, particularly with Ronaldo, that you'd show him inside. But what you have got to do, you've got to make the effort to try and exaggerate your starting position. So what you do, you're saying to the Sterling on this occasion with Alex, I'm going to show you, I'm going to exaggerate my starting position, I'm going to show you down the line towards the corner flag. Or I'm going to exaggerate my me, me starting position, I'm going to uh, show you inside, and run you into bodies, if it's been drilled, which obviously it, it hasn't been drilled. And um, it's a specific way of defending, but it's got to be absolutely spot on with regards to the placement and recovery runs of the second, third, fourth player um, from f f backwards of the ball and the and the um, the covering players behind him. Yeah, I thought I honestly thought I thought he was embarrassing at right back. We know he's got a nice, lovely language style that breaks forward and puts in lovely crosses or lovely cross field balls, and he puts a great shape on the ball and he hits the right areas behind the retreating back four. Um, to me, that's always been like a massive bonus, a massive plus on top of someone who, me personally, I prefer my defenders to be able to defend first. And that's quite clearly not the case at Liverpool. Out of Liverpool, I wouldn't say go as far as to say imploded, but from being near on unbeatable nine months ago to now being in a situation where they're not, they're not the benchmark that they was last year. You put that down to the lack of fans. You put that down to the lack of replacements for key players, such as having a big centre after coming from Van Dijk. What what do you put the reasons down to their to their? Lack? The second one, and I think it's. Uh, I think I'll be honest with you, James. I think it's the second one. I mean, if you're a member of Klopp's staff and you're on his shoulder and you're supporting him, um, you do it with uh, you know Law Law Ian and and. and uh, servitude you know what I mean you're looking out for him and I, me personally I'd, I'd say quite clearly that we persevere with this because we don't want to weaken the other area um, that being said he's made the decision and then you hear the feedback from you you know you see Roy Keane's rant that, that was uh, forwarded to me on um, um, on social media which is obviously typical um, I think he's he's capable of being uh, capable of being the best pundit on on tv but he's another one he just highlights the faults he doesn't come up with any solutions and he's he's going on about the you know lack, lack of competitive edge and the fact that it'd be another 30 years before they they win the title and then you've got soon is chiming in saying well they got beat 7-2 at aston villa with van dyke in the side you know what i mean that's when the alarm bell should have started ringing um but then again, behind the scenes, like I was going to say in defence of Klopp, you don't know what the financial constraints are um, because the Yanks might be looking for a return on their money. And they've said, well, you said you want to keep her in the centre-back. We've addressed it. I don't realise that you need strength in depth. And um, like Sunni said, when you do win a, a European Cup, when you do win a, a football uh, uh, Premier League title, that's when you, you're at your optimum level. And that is when you invest. That is when you use the prize money and your income to invest, to reinforce and replenish. Well, quite clearly he hasn't done that. They rely too much on the same goalkeeper. They rely too much on the same centre-back. And by the way, the goalkeeper had an absolute trauma. Um, every decision he made was the wrong one. And every and when he tried to execute certain techniques, they were the wrong ones. And I still can't get me around, uh, especially with a weak and back four, why you'd play it short and induce pressure with lesser players. 
um, on paper lesser players. Unless he thought, well, I've got two midfield players and centre-backs, they'll be able to play their way out. And all he did is he dug a, a, a massive hole for himself. But like I said, defensive Klopp, I think um, the Americans might be, uh, or the owners might be looking for a return on uh, on their on their investment with regards to prize money from the Champions League and the, and the Premier League title. And they've said, no, you've, wh- whatever you're going to think, whatever you're going to spend and invest, you've had. And you spent it on the goalkeeper, you spent it on, on the thing that I think that's 125 million in two players. Um, you spent it on a couple of midfield players. Uh, you, bought, you just bought the kid from Wolves, uh, etc. You know what I mean? But it's shown quite clearly that uh, there's not enough strength in depth. So that's where I think the problem lies. Jurgen Klopp's position as Liverpool manager could be under threat this year if they don't achieve, if they don't follow up on the success of last year. Well, it shouldn't be. But we know that football is a a fickle profession full of uh, treacherous, disloyal dogs, which I've got first-hand experience of that. Um, And, you know, they'll hover around you and like they'll be, uh, you know, when when, when the things are going well, they want to be part of it. When you're looking for people to be to back you, support you, be loyal, see that medium and long term you're doing the right thing and forgive you the short term, you find it's not the case. If I'm Klopp and it looks like the writing's on the wall, his best bet is to get his agent on the case and tat himself around for another job. He's had six years there this year. So that's long enough, I would think, especially in modern day football. Um, you know, he's gone in, he set out what he set out to do. Um, he came close with Borussia Dortmund. Um, he achieved it with Liverpool. Got, got a Champions League title with Liverpool. And he's won the Premier League. So he could point and say, look, I've done something for you that you ain't done for 30 years. Um, and then just like on the pastures, no. Uh, because he'll know, he'll know better than anybody. That's the industry. There's no loyalty. It's fickle. Um, and when and when you know, what I've found in my personal experience, when you actually need support the most, you don't get any. I'd like to talk a little bit about Phil Foden. He's a player that the media have been keeping praise on, rightly so. He seems to have come of age. What did you make of his performance against the Spurs? Yeah, borderline. It was borderline immaculate. He, he didn't put a foot wrong. I think his assets, which should propel him into um, England recognition, because we're sadly lacking in that area. It'll also put a little bit of pressure on Raheem Sterling, where I think there are a lot of sim- similarities. Assets, uh, he's... Um, He's probably uh, f- twice or three times the quicker version of Jack Wilshire. He's got magnificent awareness and quick feet. And he can either pass or dribble his way out of tight tight areas. Very creative, very explosive, like he showed with his goal. Um, and I think it'd be like a, a, a refreshing addition to, to the England squad. Any praise he gets, I think he fully deserves. Against Liverpool, for instance, he started in that number 10 role which then drop in deep to allow Gundogan or one of the other midfield players to attack the space left in for him. At England, it's, it's going to be hard for him to get into that position, no doubt, with the quality that we've got up top. What, what position would you play Phil Foden in? And what, what do you think his best position is so far? Well, picking up on the first first point, James, I, f- I think that um, Pep is uh, he's, he's obviously got you know, very good uh, football knowledge and coaching ability, and, but he's also blessed with with players who have got very good uh, what they call football IQ. I call it football intelligence. The latter day term is football IQ. So you're talking about something very basic that's done in training, but the players need to recognise it where he comes in short, and you get a rotation between him and, and Gundahan, right? And they were talking about him being a false number nine. Well, he won. He, he was like, in actual fact, he was. When you look, when you look at the shape off of him, he, um, I don't think there's any such thing. He, he, he was, he was like the number nine, the focal point. He was like the, on many occasions, the furthest player forward, or one of them, and he was used as a foil where the ball was punched into him, and then he was setting balls off to the to the people and players around him. Um, like I said, he's got he's got very good awareness. He's always looking either side and behind. Um, and spotting little runs or spotting little gaps, and uh, yeah, I think I think he's, uh, he's he's a tremendous player. Now, with regards to moving on to your second point, um, it's like I've remarked previously: the, the difference between club football and international football. Sometimes with club football, that's not the case with uh, Pep, because he's um, he's at a football club that's that's backed by a nation's uh, gross domestic product. Um, and he can buy who he wants, and he can he can buy players to fit in with his ideology. 
at other football clubs, what tends to be the case is you've got to make do with what you've got and you've got to work with what you've got. You've got to work with what, what you've been left. Um, because obviously when so, uh, more often than not, it happens very rarely. I think it happened with Wenger. He came into a very good situation at Arsenal after George Graham and then Bruce Rioch. And uh, he inherited the likes of Overmars, Burkamp, uh, Seaman, uh, Dixon, Bull, Keown Adams, uh, Winterburn. And then he added to them from the people he knew from uh, Clairefontaine in France, uh, young French players, right? So very rarely do you go into a ready-made situation where it just needs tinkering and a bit of adjusting, right? Um, more often than not, what you have to do, you have to build from scratch. And then you maybe need, like now, it's transfer windows. So maybe you need like two, three, four transfer windows. Um, so Pep, Pep's got that and, and he can have any player he wants. Now he can buy players to fit in with his ideology. That brings me to the international thing that you're remarking about, where as an inter international manager, this is the difference. You can have a, a play in ideology and a formation that just needs to be constantly rehearsed whereby you can, you've got the pick of the nation's best players and you can pick those players, which I think probably now Foden comes into that category, to fit in with the ideology and the shape that you want to play. His attacking players obviously get a lot of applaudits, the likes of Raheem Sterling, the likes of, well, before, the, before his sort of subdued injury, Aguero. How important has the defence of Man City been? So the likes of Laporte, Ruben Diaz, yeah. in my, my opinion, one of the most improved players this season in John Stones. How important has their form been to Man City's title challenge? Well, very quickly, right? This, this, uh, someone, re someone remarked on our podcast um, that uh, at Liverpool have had the same front three for four years, right? And they may be going a bit stout, right? So I've said that I've, my ideas on how it could be remedied. Then he brought up Man City and I went, whoa, whoa, whoa hold on a minute. You've just contradicted yourself because Manchester City... Uh, if not for four years, even longer, they've had the same front three themselves. Aguero come back from injury and got COVID, and he's now recovering from that. Jesus and Sterling, right? So then, it, and then the counter argument was, well, Pep never plays the the same the same side or the same front three or the same front two or the same person up top. He's always shuffling the pack, as you say, meaning me, right? So I said, well, that goes back to what I've said before. It's about. Um, players being receptive with their football intelligence to a change of formation two, three, four, five times during a game um, and or a change of formation and personnel to suit the opposition they're playing against, as in to, to beat them, punish them, uh, get the better of them. Okay, so I, f I think that settles that settles that argument slightly. Now, with or in my in my opinion, uh, you know, conclusively, but the, with regards to the back four, if you go back to through our... Um, uh, Football Uncensored podcast with uh, Alan Hudson and Don Shanks. I remarked about Stones when um, Don's, Don's interviewing me and Alan. He said, is that the end for him? And I said, no, there's always a way back. And the penny's got to drop that he's at one of the richest, biggest football clubs in the world now. And the only way is down. And what he's got to do is he's got to reignite his own renaissance by saying to a coach um, or saying to a youth team player, can you just come and do 20 minutes with me every afternoon? And I think it shows quite clearly that uh, that's more or less what he's done, right? This is not, James, what you've got to understand and what people who are listening have got to understand, this is not a uh, C.S. Lewis, you know, this is not like, uh, you know, a secret key and the line, the witch in the wardrobe, you know what I mean? Um, you know, or Lewis Carroll, Alice in Wonderland, where there's some sort of secret formula where someone comes up with all the answers at the Mad Hatter's Tea Party. It really is as simple and as basic as that. What you've got to do, you've got to go over, you've got to start to analyse your own game. If you're a good professional, you should always be doing that. And then what you do, you just go over the basics and you start to get a grip um, of, of your game by doing that. And the realisation um, that he started to believe a little bit too much in his own publicity and he was putting the ball at risk in bad areas unnecessarily, right? Uh, so what he's done is he's cut that out and he's playing more of a percentage game and he's being more sensible. He's being more mature. And I think he's got a grip of um, he's marking and retreating. I think he's got a grip of the dangerous areas, what I call the, the hot spot. Um, people come out with twatty terminology like the, you know, corridor of uncertainty. 
I would never use that if I was coaching because what you're doing, as well as sowing a seed for retreating back fours and defenders, be it the space between them and the goalkeeper, a corridor of uncertainty could, could also mean a corridor of uncertainty for your own forwards. And, and, and it detracts from, um, even if it's 1%, uh, from their mentality of wanting to come crashing in like a bulldozer with a Ferrari engine uh, to get the other side of the retreating back four and get a surface to the ball and get it in the back of the net. Well, with those areas, he's identified and he's getting good surfaces to the ball. He's making do with one-touch clearances, uh, whether it's with feet or head. And he's looking a far more refined, polished, dependable centre-back. And for my money, in the Euros, uh, barring injury, touch wood, please God, um, Emma Maguire, without a shadow of a doubt, should be the top two that start. Because Maguire as well, he deserves praise because I criticised him after the debacle in uh, on the Greek island and I said the 30 grand bar bill, what a load of bollocks that is. Who do these people think they are? Who does he think he is? Have a reality check. If you've got 30 grand, like do what I'll do, give it to the NSPCC or Cancer Research or Help the Aged or Guide Dogs for the Blind. And I've lost count of the amount of money I've put in and my missus to have puppies trained to help blind people get around. You understand? So if you've got a spare 30 grand, you're fucking big shot, right? What you do is instead of spunking it on the uh, uh, lager and champagne, give it give it to a, a decent course. What he's done, he's had a good talking to and he's grown up. Someone's got hold of him and said, look, get a grip, son. You know, you're captain of Man United. You're a Man United player. This is not some Mickey Mouse non-league outfit, right? Um, you're at one of the biggest clubs in the world. So he's got a grip and he deserves praise because um, I said that's, that's what he needed to do. Um, these are all in previous podcasts, so it's almost as if like we um, we might know what we're talking about. <laughs> right, can't argue with that. I want to talk a little bit about Mike Dean? Two two decisions in particular that have been highlighted, which have now been rescinded. Eunuch, eunuch. Now look, everyone has a bad day at the office. We can all make. Yeah, it. yeah, yeah. Yeah, me, me more than most. Me more than most. Yeah, I've done that. That we've all been there. I'd like to focus yeah. on on the decision making process and what's happened with Mike Dean afterwards in response to his to his decisions. Um. Well, at the end of the day, he's an highly paid like refereeing professional, well paid refereeing professional. Um, I just think he should have shown a bit more. Um. Cajones and looked at it and realised, but this is where you've got a problem. Uh, the same way as I used to do a job for the Press Association, comment, commentating on games and um, possession and fouls and set pieces and free kicks and corners and shots on target, shots off target, etc., etc. What they need is they need ex-professionals. Uh, first of all, they, uh, VAR needs uh, part of its power taken away. I think it should only be used for two or three things. And lastly, I think it should be manned by um, an ex-professional along uh, a footballer, player, alongside an ex-professional referee. But as far as I can tell at the moment, I don't know, I'm, I'm talking blind here. Um, you've got someone who they think they do, but they don't know the idiosyncrasies of the game and the little foibles and the little, the little things that players try and get away with. I think you could see quite clearly um, I mean, Mitrovic, he went down like he'd been hit with a pickaxe, right? And he's a, like, he's a proper lump. And he was all right when he was dishing it out at Newcastle. Um, you know, so I thought that was uh, embarrassing. You know, I'd, if it had been me, right? And he cut, and he's, you're, you're getting, see, I'd, I would never mark like that. People, too many players don't know how to mark anymore. And they get involved in this grappling and wrestling. Absolute fucking bullshit. I can't have it. Um, they've seen the Continentals do it. And a lot of them, embarrassingly, uh, but managers and I don't know if managers and coaches have got, have got the guts or the balls to speak up about it. You know, some of them have even got their back to the ball and they're doing the, the, the holding and the grappling. Right. So listen, if I'm if I'm marking him where I should be marking him and but I'm close and he don't want to get tangled up with me and he pulls his arm like that and his elbow catches me there. I'll just turn around. I'll say to him, do yourself a favor. Fucking watch yourself with your elbows. Otherwise, you won't finish the game. Right. Uh, I wouldn't go down like a sack of shit like I've been hit by, uh, you know, I don't know, Club of Lang. Uh, you know what I mean? Any, any, but I wouldn't have gone down like I've been hit by a boxer, like a cruiserweight boxer. I'd have just, that's what I'd have said to him. 
What you know, watch it, watch, watch what you do with your fucking elbows, or you won't be finishing the game. Simple as that. Right? I wouldn't have gone down to try to try and get him sent off. That's the first thing. Second thing is he either knew what he was doing and he was like mega slippery and he's he's got off with it, and or um Mike Dean quite clearly don't know what he's looking at. And I I just think if you can't get it after two, maybe three replays, someone said he looked at it 20 times. If you can't get it right after two or three, then um I'd hazard a guess you're 90% on the way towards making the wrong decision anyway. Decision to send Benarek off for his foul against Marshall in the Man United game. Uh, I thought it was the right decision. Yeah, I thought it was the right decision. It got the wrong side. Um, a touch is a touch. He prevented a goal scoring opportunity. I think it was the right decision. And there's, there's no, there was no defence for that. And there's definitely no defence for the one earlier in the game where the geezer went. I mean, I've done one myself. I've done one myself and um, I got slaughtered for it. You know what I mean? It was nil-nil at the time. I was playing in midfield. I'd had a good run of games in midfield for Gillingham. Played really, really well. Um, I really was on blob for uh, for a good couple of years. And then Peacock knows it all. Sorry to go over old ground. Um <clears throat> but what happened was me and Dick Tyburn were playing and it, it was nil-nil. I think Bournemouth, I actually, Harry, when, I'm, when I see Harry, Harry Redknapp, he, he thanks me for keeping him in a job because they were on like a, a disastrous run of uh, defeats. And uh, John Beck and Nigel Spackman were putting this up about kicking people up in the air. And I went in very similar on Spackman to the tackle by the, uh, the black kid on McTominay. And I've got a straight red card. And then uh, Bournemouth ran out 5 nil winners. And it saved Harry's job. <laughs> so so uh, I think they were both, I think they were both uh, deserve red cards. And it don't matter with all the, well, I hardly touched him. I didn't touch him. Just, they know what they're doing. And at the end of the day, um, A, they allowed themselves to end up too deep. And B, it was a, it was a goal scoring opportunity. So by the letter of the law, I, like guilty as charged. Whether Mike Dean got the decision right or wrong, it's up for debate. With, with the VAR bar option as well, everybody's going to have an opinion on it, no doubt. Mm. What happened after in terms of Mike Dean receiving death threats, his family, the abuse on social media? As an ex-professional, as someone that's worked in the game, what, what are your thoughts on that? Um, false bravado, nonsense overreaction, uh, laughable, um, utter nonsense, cobblers. It ain't going to happen. It ain't going to happen. I mean, I know it's like um, I often remark on uh, London that it's become um, a third world, lawless, borderline banana republic shithole, but we're not really at the stage where it's Colombia just yet. So, um, you know, it wouldn't have happened. And at the end of the day, all they do, West Ham supporters, is just like uh, they make themselves look idiots. You can't, you can't go around threatening to kill people over a game of football. I mean, what, what, what's the fucking world coming to? What utter nonsense. So, uh, yeah, I mean, a bit of an overreaction, but you, you take it with a pinch of salt. If he comes across the West Ham support wherever he lives and he takes a clump, it's up to him to stand up for himself. You know what I mean? But really and truly, you know, get a grip. Check yourself. Have a little look. Who, who, who do you think you are? You know, I mean, we've all had things in our life where um, we want to do things to people. But, um, and I mean, like, from a personal point of view, like, um, quite serious. But, yeah, you've got, you've got to have a look at yourself, haven't you? Have a reality check. Is it easy to give advice and not react when you're not, or I'm not the person that the the abuse or the threats are being directed at. Because I know from your point of view, someone's only got to disrespect the black cap trade and you're, you're ready to go full full Arsenal mode on them. So how, how would you handle something more personal than that, the, 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 the severity level that, that Mike Dean's had to deal with? I don't know what to say. I mean, I'm getting old now, aren't I? But in my younger days, um, when I say younger, I'm not going back that far to when I first wrote the book five years ago and then when I first come into the trade at the age of 43 um, I've had problems with thing, threats from people I just ask them where they are um, and I tell them where I am and I ask them if they want to meet up 
Um, I think I've had the offer taken up twice. But I don't. I don't really want to go down that road anymore. You've got to be. This is professional sport. You've got to be above all that. You can't. I mean, you can't. You can't. I've, listen, my second book. Um, I naively believed the opposite, but politics is inextricably tied up with professional sport in this country, uh, particularly professional football, and the same as other countries, right? And I've done a massive, uh, well, not a massive, I've done a big chapter that's going to make a few enemies with regards to the former British Empire and Commonwealth, right? Um, and now I think we've been browbeaten and I think we've been let down by successive governments, right? But even though it is tied up with that, you can't have a situation where at the other end, um, what's going on on the streets is allowed to infiltrate professional sport, anything. Uh, anything to do with it, racism, vi but it's all one big fat contradiction when they talk about racism and violence and uh, all this, you can't allow it to infiltrate, but unfortunately that's the case. And then what you got, you got this ongoing um, intricately woven spider's web that uh, distracts people's in uh, focus and uh, messes with their intelligence or messes with their opinion and they're unable to divide it up forensically. Like I like to think I can. And I'll just say, well, you want to debate on that? We'll have a debate on that. You want to debate on this? We'll have a debate on this. You want to talk about that? We'll talk about that. You'll find at the end of it, conclusively, that um, more often than not, I'm right. And it's all one big fat contradiction. You can't have, you can't have a situation where uh, you've got this lowest common denominator, uh, common denominator mentality uh, where it's, where it's going to be allowed to uh, infiltrate professional sport. 